Hello, everybody. Welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. Uh, this, of course, is where we talk with entrepreneurs about how they are handling their businesses and building resilience into them uh, during this very strange time. I realized this morning I'm my pandemic wardrobe needs to change because every video we make of this, I'm wearing the same thing. Blue hoodie, white shirt, blue shirt, blue hoodie. Anyway, welcome. It's great to have you all here. I'm super excited about today. Before we begin, I wanted to thank E-Trade for their support of this series. Uh, trading isn't for everybody, but E-Trade is, whether it's saving for a rainy day or for your retirement, E-Trade has you covered. They can help you check your financial goals off your list, and with a team of professionals giving you support when you need it, you can be confident that your money is working hard for you. You can get more than just trading with E-Trade. To get started today, go to eTrade.com slash NPR for more information. And if you do go there, make sure to go to eTrade.com slash NPR so they know that you came from this show and they will continue to support us because we need the support to do this, to bring this to you for free. So thank you for joining us. My guest today is Beverly Leon. Uh, Beverly Leon. Um, Beverly is the founder and CEO of Local Civics. It's an ed tech company that's helping students build their civic and community leadership skills through game-based learning. This is super important at a time when people don't really understand how government and civics works. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, before Beverly started this company, she was a professional soccer player uh, in several countries, including in the English Premier League, which is the best soccer league on earth. Or, you know, please don't don't uh, bite my head off if you disagree or think the Bundesliga or the Italian league is it's it's one of the best in the world. Let's just say um, Beverly left to pursue an MBA and then start the civics company. It's a pretty new startup. I'm super excited to talk to you about it. Welcome, Beverly. Great to have you. Thanks so much for having me, Guy. Real privilege and honor to be here. Huge fan of the show and excited to share about local civics. Um, thank you so much. And and if you're watching, um, however you're watching YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn, um, and you've got questions for Beverly or for how you teach civics to kids, please submit your questions. Um, as so many of you know, um, you know, the, the way education has changed over the past year has been pretty dramatic, right? It's this past year has kind of accelerated um, education technology and will continue to accelerate it, um, including in how we teach kids about civics. So before we, we get into it, um, Beverly, I wanted you to kind of explain how local civics works. So you're still in startup mode. Um, I know it was just founded two years ago in 2018 or now two and a half years ago. Um, how, what, what, how does it work? Explain it to me if I'd never, you know, as if I'd never heard of this before. Absolutely. At Local Civics Guy, we teach kids about power. We help them navigate and explore power. We help them learn about their own power to create impact in their community. And through our goal-based technology, we help create individualized experiences for students to understand policies in their local community build their own civic leadership, and ultimately to define their own civic journey. How do we do this? We allow students to set accessible participation goals. And this is either in your classroom, with your friends, with your teachers. They can use our platform to find events that meet those goals. So think about this like an event break for middle and high school students. And then they can track their progress, set harder goals, set more challenging goals, and explore different parts of their community. So it's like um, it's a, a web-based platform, basically, and it helps to get students, and I think middle and high school students right now, right? It gets them to participate in local events that are happening in their community? Yes, exactly. So you know, setting the goal to participate is one of the, the key parts here. You can't just say, I want to be involved in community and jump right in, and it's really overwhelming, right? There's all these diff different spaces. If no one's brought you to those spaces before, I don't know about you, I don't like showing up to places without either a friend or a classmate, no. right? Um, so, exactly. So how do you introduce young people into these really powerful spaces of community without creating that accessible on-ramp for them? And huh. so through that platform, we can actually allow students to set goals that they can meet and then deepen their engagement once they've had that initial touch point 
to attend uh, with friends. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So let, let's just think of a, like a practical example of how it would work, right? Because I think it's you've rolled this out in a few, and I think about 300 schools right now, it's still in, in, in beta. I mean, you're still building this and, and creating curriculum and things. But right now, let's say um, I show up to the platform, what, what could I do? Yeah, so in, and right now it looks very different from what it looked like a year ago um, for when schools were open, there were events happening in our communities, but today on the platform for the, the hundreds of, of users we have and, and, and hundreds of educators that are engaging, students can find events. So take New York City, for example. We have events that are either happening in the school community, student government meetings, um, student council meetings. We have events that are happening at the New York Public Library. We have events that are happening that are part of our civic infrastructure community board meetings that we should be plugging into as citizens. Students can go onto our platform and they might get a goal from their principal, from their history teacher, from their English language arts teacher to say, you have to get to two events this month. That's your homework assignment. They can then use our platform to choose which event they'd like to engage with. So we don't tell students Here's what good civics looks like. We, we share with students, your goal is to engage in your community. You can choose how and when, but the next step after that, after you get that first touch point of engagement, you have a student that might go to the library event, is to bring it back into your classroom. And the next goal is to say, I'd like to present at my library. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to volunteer at the library. Huh. And so from there, you can actually start deepening your engagement once you've had that initial exploration or discovery, uh, we've also launched our own event series. So students can engage with events that our instructional team deliver. And wow. so those are now all remote uh, opportunities. So we bring in professionals, elected officials to come engage with students, candidates running for office in their local community. We also bring in you know, youth activists who discuss about their community organizing. So for example, we have the founders of Teens Take Charge. They offer sessions on our platform that any young person can plug into and begin to grow you know, that initial discovery of you know, what does it mean for me to be an active citizen? Where can I start? And here are my initial ideas, where could I take this? So it's that, it's that entry point for our portal and, and then the goals really allow them to amplify it. So it's a little bit like a fitness tracker for civics education. You can, you can think of it like that. And it may be the, the athlete in me that this is a tool that, that I needed, right? These are the tools that you, know, you don't wake up and, and start running the 100 meter dash or running a marathon. It takes training. It takes practice in routine building, right? Yeah. So you can think about it like that as if you're 12 years old, where do you start beginning to engage when you're 17 or 25, right? We're, we're beyond the population and age group we work with. What does that look like for you to start? Beverly, um, I know I mentioned earlier you were a professional soccer player. I mean, playing at the highest international levels um, in several countries, Italy, the UK, I think Iceland. Um, Tell me how you, you got to this idea for what you are doing today. What, what, what was it from your life that, that led you to want to create this? Absolutely. So there are a couple things from as I reflect back of how did I end up working on local civics? Where did the seed of the idea come from? And I think a couple things come to mind. So one, I grew up in this really small town, this red town in blue Massachusetts called Rentham. Uh, my family, my parents immigrated to this country in their early 20s. And so I'm a first generation American, wow. one of the only black families in, in this town. And you know, through my youth, I played sport. So sport was the transformative lever for me. It allowed me to be a part of community, to see my own power in community. So eventually as a young girl, I'd play soccer, but then I would go back and I would coach and mentor the, you know, my younger self. 
that opened up opportunities and doors for me that I don't think would have been possible had I not been engaged in sport throughout my whole life. It brought me to Columbia University, where I was able to play at an elite level and continue to coach. I coached in Harlem. I coached for FC Harlem, an incredible youth sports org. And when I graduated from Columbia, I actually got this, I landed this awesome job on Wall Street. On my weekends, I would continue coaching. And there was a moment where you know, I'm telling young people, follow your dreams, you know, lean into your passions, all the while I'm not living my own. Um, and there was a moment where I had to take a, a step back and say, if I'm not willing to take this type of risk for my, my own life, who am I to ask a young person to actually dream big, right? So that was sort of you know, what felt like the biggest risk of my life of leaving that, the comfort and stability of that job. And I moved to Iceland. I played in Iceland, uh, and then I traveled to Italy, spent a year in Italy, and then to the UK. Hmm. But as I think about I'm, I'm moving through different democracies. I'm moving through different communities, playing with women from all around the world, and coaching young people in all of these spaces as a part of just my engaged citizenship in those, those communities. My time in Italy, in particular, was really challenging. It was very isolating. I could see the spaces of community I wanted to be a part of, but couldn't connect to them, right? And that immediately reminded me, one, of growing up as, as this Black girl in Rentham, right, where, you know, very much outsider perspective or what would feel like that as a young person. Yeah. It also reminded me of coaching young people in Harlem that had the same, you know, same sense of disconnection or disengagement with community that was right down the street. And so I think that's really that feeling there was the seed of local civics. If I'm living my dream and being able to play overseas and live abroad and have these experiences, how can I use my gifts and passions and resources and channel it into a purpose to actually try to build community back home in New York City, in Harlem, right? And and that's really, you know, how do we better connect young people to our communities? What are the channels and access points we need to create as adults and educators for them to be empowered to move in these spaces? If you are just joining us, uh, welcome. This is How I Built This Resilience Edition from NPR. I'm talking with Beverly Leon. Beverly is the founder of a new startup called Local Civics, and it's a platform that helps to connect and to uh, to connect young people, middle school and high school kids, um, with civics events and to help deepen their engagement with local civics. Beverly, we are in the middle of a civics crisis in the United States. We've seen that unfold over the last decade and more. Um, people are very frustrated with how government um, operates. And in many cases, they're not always sure why it operates in certain ways. We got to a point earlier this year where many people believed that the, the vice president of the United States had the power to nullify an election, even though it is not a constitutional power, as the vice president explained to the then president. Um, this is a problem. We, we have a huge problem in America. How do you solve that problem? How can we start to solve that problem through what you are creating? Yeah, Guy, you've, you've named you know, some of the biggest challenges facing our democracy, right? There's increasing polarization in our communities. We're seeing it every day on our computer screens, on our TV screens. And as we started to look at how we tackle this problem, how is local civics positioned to actually work on this in, in partnership with others, we started to see even, you know, what we're seeing are the, the, the symptoms that, right, how can we tackle that root cause? And we looked at some of the data. So 2016, you know, in particular for young people, only about 43% of my age cohort voted in the presidential election. So that's 18 to 29 year olds, 43% showed up for one of our largest, our, our presidential election. You can imagine what that number looks like down to our local elections, to our school boards to our town councils, uh, much lower. This year, we, we had a boost in youth turnout, right? And, and I think it's, the numbers are coming out around 55%, but it's still too low. So one, our team is hyper-focused on how do we allow young people to see how important voting is? Two, you know, 
civic knowledge. You're talking about what are our constitutional rights? What are the processes and laws that we've actually built as a country and community to ensure that we have equal you know, representation and justice? And you know, civic knowledge is at an all-time low. I, I think it's around one in four adults can name all three branches of the federal government. So even at the base, most basic level, um, where we're not informed about how our government works and the powers we have as citizens to impact that, to, to create change. And what we're doing at Local Civics is the on-ramp. If you haven't been invited into spaces of power and community, you're not going to wake up at 18 and suddenly start exploring those places of power. And, and one of those rights we get granted at 18 is the right to vote. Um, if you can think back to when you were that old, did you understand all the spaces that that vote literally counted towards? And if you're not going to wake up at 18 and understand that, you're not going to wake up at 25 or 35 and understand that. Uh, so for us, at the root, it has to start in our schools. It has to start with our young people. And if we can provide that channel, not just the civic knowledge, if we can provide a channel for them to also apply that knowledge and discover those spaces, it's going to be really powerful for a young person when they start to say, hey, here's an opportunity for us to create a change here. Where do I start? Who are the stakeholders? What are the, the laws? And, and how does power work here? What is my power? And so at root, what we're trying to help young people do is find those opportunities, those assets, those civic spaces down the street. So when they're actually older and they can vote, or actually even at their young age, they can connect it to our national level. Yeah. Absent that, it's hard to take what's happening at our Capitol, what's happening in Congress, and say, well, what does this mean for me when I'm walking in, when I'm going to school every day, and we're in a remote hybrid learning model? What does it mean when we're, we're actually passing federal or local policy? Where does that stem from? You know, one of the things that I, I was always very impressed with in Europe was you would see signs all over, uh, all over the roadways and um, in front of public works projects that would say, you know, your, the European Union is funding this project. Your tax money is, you know, you see that in, in, in some states. In California, you see that. Um, I don't know how much of an impact it has, but I do think that it is a small signal to try and connect people with what they do. Because as a citizen, you, you basically, if you're not engaged, you're just paying taxes, right? Um, and, and so it's hard to understand how, what your role is in, in, in a society. Um, and I think that's, that to me, is one of the, the big challenges. The other huge challenge we have in the United States, and this is going to be really controversial. I think some people might totally disagree with me and want to, you know, bring out their pitchforks. I think we have too many elections. I mean, I live in California, and if you look at the ballot in California, it's really, really unwieldy. I mean, there's so many ballot initiatives. There are so many people to vote for. It's it's so overwhelming. And, you know, I'm I've been a journalist, right? So... I spend a lot of time trying to read these things, and for me, it's really hard. So for somebody who has to work all day, you know, to find the time to engage in civics and to really learn about communities is hard. It's hard work. Absolutely. And first, it's overwhelming. What one of what I'm when you're here, when I'm hearing you say that, what I'm feeling is that overwhelming feeling of how can I possibly inform myself? Uh, about everything that's happening. And there's a thread from there when we work with young people. There's that same, well, I, need, I don't know who I'm voting for because I need to study all the issues and I need to know everything about every position. And you know, my first response would say, you know, we, we lean into critical thinking as students are starting to evaluate these, but even as adults, how can we use our, our thinking skills to say, what's happening here, how important are each of these elections, and how is it going to impact the values and the needs of my community, right? So even if we can't possibly understand each ballot measure, do you have the skills to critically examine each one, right? And so I think that it's overwhelming that there are so many, uh, but I, I'm thinking back to my experience living in the UK. Um, when I was at Oxford, you, you know, not just British citizens, you, anyone that lived in that city 
could vote on the city elections. And I had just been transplanted from, you know, Northeast England down to Oxford. I knew nothing about the community, but the skills I needed to explore that were, can I understand what's happening here? Do I understand how the policy will impact what I care about, the needs of my community, uh, the needs of the country? And so I, I would take the step back and say, there are many elections, but if given the time, do you have the skills to think about each of those ballot measures as propositions and bills? And if the answer is yes, you're already on your way to being engaged, for far too many people, that answer is no. They don't have the ability to actually think critically about the impact of some of the this legislation and policy. And, and that's a that's a problem, right? Yeah. Beverly, I want to um, I'm getting some questions in from from viewers um, about the business side of this because you are a for-profit, right? I mean, this is not a nonprofit business, even though you have a very nonprofit mission. So you have to create a sustainable business model, even if you are a nonprofit, you would. Yep, um, yep. Talk a little bit about the business model of of your company. It's an ed tech company. It's a very competitive space. You've got to get into schools and to really scale it and you know, you've got to get to, to the school districts. Tell me about how this could be a sustainable proposition. So the reason I went to Columbia Business School and, and to back up a, a bit, local civics, I, you know, after I retired from soccer, I, I actually brought you know, I went to study youth civic engagement at Oxford. I was going to go do a PhD. As I started leaning into that research, I realized that, wow, this is, this is way bigger um, than, you know, the lens of sport that I had, had I, that inspired me, that it had activated my civic engagement. And, you know, the question I couldn't get out of my head was, in what ways can we use technology to better connect young people to community? That was the, the first question I had asked, and how can we use this technology to build civic leadership? I knew at that moment when I was doing the research, I had to understand how to build a sustainable business, how to build a team um, that's motivated, and how to, you know, how to sell, generate revenues. So I brought that idea and really used Columbia Business School to incubate local civics. I lived in a classroom in the South Bronx working with hundreds of students and hundreds of educators getting feedback just on the entrepreneurial, you know, creating a product, right? So if we set aside um, our mission, which is, you know, a huge need and, and challenge we're facing as a country, but how do we build products that really solve a problem? What job did we need to complete um, for students, our student users, and our teachers, and then the schools that are paying us. And if we could get enough, if we could listen closely enough, we could build a tool that would add value at each part to each of those different, you know, users. And what we found is that, you know, one, we're not just selling a technology product. Um, we're, we're helping schools actually use data to inform their decision making around school culture, use data to elevate their curriculum. What we also found is that educators needed training. So we also began engaging in professional development and we generate revenue through that channel. And finally, we, we work in partnership with corporations who help fund and sponsor some of this work. Uh, and on top of that, the core and the scaling methodology is through technology, right? We, we sell our technology on a per student basis. So it's really an enterprise SaaS model, but we've done the deep work to say, are we adding value to schools and the person that's paying us? And if we continue to grow and scale that, uh, we will actually continue to have a uh, generate revenues. And, you know, in, in the past year, you know, we, we've been able to bootstrap our company uh, through just a couple grants uh, from Columbia, from, from different social venture funds to actually grow our revenues, you know, into the six figures. And that's something that, you know, we didn't take outside capital to accomplish that. And, you know, we're at an inflection point where we're looking to scale this and, and to engage partners that saying, hey, these are resources that we need. You know, how do we engage you? And, and that's our business, right? We, that's our sustainable revenue model that also makes 
achieving our mission a sustainable one. Do you, Beverly, do you think that th there's over the past few years, there's been a lot of talk about our model, our, our model of democracy and whether that model needs to be updated or even fixed or completely changed. This is a serious conversation that, that has entered into the national dialogue. Do you think American style democracy is broken and needs to be fixed? Or do you think it's a matter of educating people about how it works? It's an interesting question. I do not think American democracy is broken. What I think has happened in American democracy, and if we take a look to our founding, it's been extremely exclusive. It has not been an inclusive democracy. And we, we look at that at core amendments that have granted the right to vote to people, to, you know, to black folks in our country, um, to women. And if we take a look at what American democracy meant in 1776, it's not what, um, you know, the perfect union that we actually needed it to be. So while I didn't, do not think it's broken, I think that we can create more inclusive pathways for our citizens. And until everyone is actually provided that on-ramp into our civic life, and so not just at the voting booth, but into spaces of power, uh, in the spaces of power that determine our material reality, the, the spaces in our community, our family, our friends, we're going to continue to see this, you know, it's going to feel broken, right? It's going to continue to say, this isn't working, something needs to change. And for, for me, that is because it is exclusive. Spaces of power have been exclusive. Uh, this is the first year I am seeing a Black woman as vice president, right? That This 2021, and that's a problem. But the opportunity I think we have in this moment in time is to actually open those channels up and not just for, you know, our focus is young people. So already we discount and disempower how young people participate. Well, you're, you're 17, just wait until you're 18. That's when you really can make a difference. And that undermines and devalues actually the unique contributions every single person can have. And I think that carries on into you know, adulthood. If you haven't been invited in, if, if someone's telling you you're not important at 16, why do you think you're going to be any more important at 26, right? When it carries forward. And so I think the shift that we can do um, and that we can all work towards is you know, not fixing this broken democracy, but making sure that it's actually working. It's actually democratic, right? Um, so I don't know if I exactly answered your, your question there, but, but that's, that's how I think about it. We're missing an opportunity to, to actually move our country forward, to create this more uh, you know, perfect space and union. But it sounds like what you're saying is there is an opportunity now. Absolutely. And this past year alone, one of the things our, our team reflected on, you know, not only was there a paradigm shift in how, you know, in education, right? We're an education company and that whole market shifted from the business side. We had a paradigm shift in this consciousness raising um, with social unrest. We had a historic movement for Black lives. This is one of the first times I've seen everyone in the United States, uh, really engaging in what justice can mean in this country. And the opportunity is to create those accessible and inclusive spaces. We happen to do it in, you know, in the midst of a, a 2020 presidential election where the majority of folks could not vote in person, right? So we had to, you know, our whole country had to innovate in order to achieve that. We had to figure out how to deliver a census, take a census count um, in the midst of this. And at the same time, we had to engage young people that were moving into this activation point of now you can vote to educate and inform and ensure that they had those channels to engage. And so that, you know, that opportunity, we can continue to innovate. Uh, but I, I do think there's a moment where, you know, 
the majority of our country is saying something has to change here and, and where do we start? And for us, you know, our team will continue working with young people, but it's going to be in collaboration and partnership with at every other sort of entry point for this, for our democ democracy really to be a thriving one. Beverly Leon of Local Civics, thank you so much for being here, for joining us. Thank you so much, Guy. Thanks, everybody, for watching. A couple of quick announcements before we go, so don't hang up just yet. Uh, our latest podcast episode is out. It's the story of Atlassian um, with Mike Cannon-Brooks and Scott Farquhar. It's a tech giant out of Australia. It's such a cool story. They built it. They bootstrapped also for many, many years out of their dorm room. Um, also, we are on Clubhouse. If you are on Clubhouse, we have a How I Built This Room on Clubhouse now, and we're doing events there. Last night, we had an event, and who showed up? Steve Case, the founder of AOL, Nancy Twine, the founder of Briogeo, Melissa Butler, the founder of The Lip Bar, Jamie Simonoff, the founder of Ring, um, Brian Scudamore, the founder of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. They just showed up in the room, and I brought them on stage. It was so fun. If you are on Clubhouse, please follow the How I Built This Club and um, and – yeah, it's really fun. Um, also, we just announced our first virtual How I Built This live podcast taping. Um, it's going to happen next month with best-selling author and podcast host Jay Shetty. Um, he is a former monk. Um, it's such a cool – he's such a cool person. If you know anything about Jay or don't, come check it out if you're looking for peace and clarity. Tickets are are very cheap, and in fact, you can get them for free. You, you can find out more if you go to the NPR uh, website, nprpresents.org. Um, so live taping, come join us, come bring your questions. Um, if you're a fan of how I built this, the podcast, uh, we also have a book that has been out for a couple months. So check it out. That is the book. Here we go. Um, and that's it for today. We'll see you uh, back here um, next week. Beverly, thank you so much again. Thanks so much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks.